Hi, my name's Katie and welcome to my channel. In this video today, I'm going to talk about African cichlid parameters, specifically for Lake Malawi cichlids. I'm going to talk about pH, GH and KH, what these values mean, why they're different for African cichlids, how to test for them, and then also how to maintain them if you want to achieve the recommended values for each of these things for your African cichlids. So without further ado, let's get into the video. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a like, and I would love for you to subscribe to my channel if you would like to see more videos like this. The parameters that Lake Malawi cichlids live in in the wild are quite different to other freshwater fish. They have a pH on the more alkaline side of around 7.8 to 8.5 and the general hardness of the water is around a 9 to 12 and the carbonate hardness is around a 10 to 12. For most other freshwater fish, the pH is more a 6.5 to a 7.5 and the GH and KH is more around a 4 to an 8. The reason that it's so different for Lake Malawi cichlids is to do with the environment that they reside in. Lake Malawi is mainly comprised of rocks and the minerals that these rocks release into the water raise the pH of the water, but they also raise the KH and the GH too. When it comes to matching your parameters in your aquarium to what these fish are accustomed to in the wild, it's not necessarily something that you have to do, but it might be something that you would like to try if you're interested in learning about it and how to maintain those parameters. With fish, the most important thing is having stability. So you don't want to have a pH that is going to be changing dramatically. So if you are going to try and raise your pH to suit the needs of the fish, then you've got to be willing to know how to maintain it consistently between water changes and when doing water changes as well. So pH ranges from zero to 14. A pH of seven is neutral, a pH above seven is alkaline, and below seven is acidic. Like I mentioned before, minerals in water from rocks make pH become more alkaline. What will make a pH become more acidic is having waste or decaying organic matter in the water, or having a high content of CO2 in the water. As nitrates build up in your tank, what will happen is the pH will be more inclined to become lower and more acidic. So having a high pH is one thing, but we need to be able to maintain it. The way that we do that is through the KH, which is the carbonate hardness. This acts as a neutralizer for any acidic compounds that form in your water and make it resistant to changes. In Lake Malawi, there are a lot of carbonates and that's what helps the lake to be able to maintain its high pH and be resistant to things like rain, which is more acidic. Then general hardness or GH is related to how much calcium and magnesium there is in your water. If the carbonates that you have in your water are calcium carbonates or magnesium carbonates, then that's also going to raise your general hardness of your water as well. But if the carbonates are not related to either magnesium or calcium, then it's not going to have an impact on your general hardness. That's why with a Lake Malawi setup, the easiest way to maintain these parameters is to look for things that release specifically calcium carbonates into your water. There's two categories of methods that you can use. There's the natural ways of raising these things, but then there's also using supplements like buffer or adding in rift salts into your tank. When it comes to using the natural ways, things that have calcium carbonates in them are rocks like limestone. It is also things like crushed coral or even things like aragonite sand. In my tank here, I've got Texas Holy Rock, which is a type of limestone. And then I've also got crushed coral in my two FX6 filters. The sand I have is not aragonite, it's just normal pool filter sand. So it's not gonna be doing anything to the parameters of the water. The other thing that you can use to raise your pH on its own is making sure that you've got sufficient surface agitation. So that's gonna allow any carbon dioxide to be able to gas off from your water. 
You can achieve surface agitation by using an air pump and having bubbles in your tank. You can do it by facing your filter outlet towards the top of the water, or you can get a wave maker like what I've got and face that towards the surface of the water to make sure that it's moving around and you're breaking the surface of the water. The other thing that you can use are supplements. So I'm gonna show you the two things that you can use. What we have here is Malawi buffer and we've got cichlid lake salt. So the Malawi buffer is going to raise both your pH and your KH in your fish tank, but this will not raise your GH. The reason this will not raise your GH is because it's got carbonates in it, but it doesn't specifically have magnesium or calcium based carbonates in it. And we need magnesium and calcium to have any type of effect on the general hardness of the water. Whereas this here, the cichlid lake salt is specifically designed to increase your GH because it's full of magnesium and calcium. In most cases, you're going to want to use a combination of natural methods as well as supplements to raise your tanks GH, KH and pH. To give you an example, my tap water comes out at a pH of 7.8, a KH of 5 and a GH of 8. By using just the natural methods, so the limestone in the tank and the crushed coral, it will raise my pH to an 8, my KH to a 7 and my GH to a 9. So it's not making a huge difference. But in saying that, if you were to have more of these things or if you had aragonite sand, it might make a bigger difference than what I've got in my tank. Either way, even if you're using natural methods to raise the pH and KH, you'll probably want to have supplements on hand anyway, because if you're doing water changes, that's when you're going to want to add in your buffer to make sure that your KH is maintained and that your pH isn't going to have a huge swing as well, particularly if the tap water that you're adding in is lower than your aquarium pH. Now what I'm going to do is show you how to actually test these parameters in your water using an API test kit. So let's get into that now. All right, so here is our API test kit. So we've got our high range pH, our KH and our GH. Your high range pH will come in a master test kit if you do get one. So it's called the Freshwater Master API test kit. It will also come with a normal range pH tester. If you test your normal range pH and it's blue, then that means that you need to use the high range one because it's probably exceeding what's within this neutral to acidic range. But I know that mine's in the high range, so I'm going straight to my high range pH. Then what doesn't come in the master test kit, uh, these two things. You can buy KH on its own if you would like to, or you can get the combined test kit that has the KH and the GH. I recommend just getting the combined one because I made the mistake of only getting KH and I was curious and I just wanted to know what my GH is and do a bit of experimentation with adding magnesium into the tank to see how it would change. So if you are getting into looking at your high range pH and KH, you're probably going to want to test GH anyway. So I think just get the two of them and save the money. So what we'll do first is we'll go and get the water out of the tank and then we'll do our testing and we'll see what our values come up as. So what I'm going to use is this little thing here. What are they called? I think it starts with P, I can't remember. But I got this in my kit for my refractor meter when I was doing salt water stuff. I think you can get these from pharmacies and stuff like that, even for free, if you just go and ask them. A pipette, that's what it's called. So I use a little pipette because it's just more easier to get an exact amount. And also there's nothing more annoying than using your hand and having to get your hand wet, but then stuffing it up constantly where you put too much in, then you've got to pour some out, then you pour too much out. So using a pipette just makes it a lot easier. So we've got our water and Let's bring it over to the table and do some testing. So I'm just gonna do them one at a time because I don't want the temperature and stuff to actually change if I'm leaving all three of them full of water for too long. So let's just do pH first. So I always just give them a little bit of a shake before I do it. For our high range pH, we just need to add five drops of the solution in. So one, two, three, four, 
you don't really have to squeeze on it to do it, but sometimes you do just a little bit, but you just have to be careful. I try and have the bottle as horizontal, I mean, as vertical as possible. And this will just take around a minute to develop. So I find pH is pretty quick to develop, but I normally just leave it for a little bit just to let it go. All right, so I've got that one going. And while we're waiting on that, what I'm gonna do is go and get our water out for our KH and GH test. All right, so I've just gotten some water out for KH. One thing I will just mention with these API test kits, just be really careful with these because they're easy to knock over and they break very easily. I think I've smashed like three of these before. So just be wary with them. Now for KH, all we're gonna do is add one drop, then give it a shake. And once the color changes from blue to yellow, that's going to be our value for KH. So all we're doing is measuring how many drops we put into it. And then we're gonna use this little chart here to work out what our degrees of KH or our parts per million are for it on here. So let's do that. The solution itself is actually yellow. So that's an easy way to remember it if you don't write on the back what it is because you're just waiting for it to turn the color that the solution is itself. So this one is kind of a bit monotonous to do, but oh, see, it's really easy to accidentally add more than one drop. I think I caught that, that it, I think it got sucked back in, but it's annoying if you get pretty far through the process and then you've accidentally added an extra drop, then you'll notice I've got some paper here because I have terrible working memory. So I know that if I don't write it down each drop, then I'll lose count. And when you have a higher KH, you end up being around like 10 drops. So it takes a while to get to that point. So that's two drops. So as you can see, I'm just doing one drop at a time and shaking it. And once this solution goes our yellowy orange color, that's when we'll know. All right, so our KH is somewhere in between 11 and 12. You could see that it started to go green at 11, but once I added in the 12th drop, then we got to 12. So we know it's gonna be somewhere in between. If we have a look on here, so we did between 10 and 11 drops, so it's between 196 and 214 parts per million. And that is within the range that we want it to be for African cichlids. So all the way down from 10 to 12 is what we aim for for KH. So now we've done KH, let's do our GH, which is exactly the same process, except for this one, we're gonna be waiting for the water to go from orange to green. So let's get started. All right, so our GH is also a 12. So if we have a look at our little chart here, we want our GH to try and be at least around nine and we can have it all the way up to 12. So we've got 214.8 parts per million for that. So both our KH and our GH are within a good healthy range. Then if we have a look at our pH that we tested just before, this one is falling around about 
which is stable. My pH has always been 8.2. That really doesn't shift. It is the KH and the GH that will not naturally stay at 12 unless I add things into it. And if I do a water change without adequate KH, then my water will drop more to around a 7.8 from a water change. But by buffering it, I can actually keep it between an 8 and an 8.2, even if I do a huge water change. So in terms of if you're looking at adjusting your pH, you want to do it in slow increments. Using some of these more natural passive measures like adding in the limestone or crushed coral can be a really great way to start off and slowly get your pH and KH to creep up a little bit higher. But if you're not going to be using those methods and you're only going to be relying on supplements, that's fine as well. But you just want to make sure that you're not changing the pH more than 0.2 increments in 24 hour periods. So you just want it to be a slow process where you're getting it to creep up towards where you want it to be. Probably I'm going to say that you're always going to want to have supplements for when you do water changes because you're going to need to be able to really buffer your new water that you're putting in unless your tap water has the same pH as your tank water. So I'll show you what I use to do that. I have this here which is called Malawi Victoria Buffer and I mainly use this then to actually raise my KH more than anything, not so much my pH. I just want this to buffer the water which is pretty much what it's for. So it also will adjust your pH if you're struggling to maintain a higher pH, it will adjust it to a 7.8 to an 8.4, but it's primarily a buffer because it's adding in that carbonate that you want in your water to raise your KH you use one teaspoon for each 40 to 80 litres. I use one teaspoon for each 40 litres and if I was initially setting this tank up and filling it with water, the tank is 630 litres, then my canister filters are holding 20 litres each in them. So we're looking at a tank volume of about 670 litres. And so all I do is I use the 40 litres for mine. So I divide 670 by 40 and then that gives us 16. So 16 teaspoons to dose the whole tank to the KH of 12 and obtain that. Now for water changes, if I do a 50% water change, then I just half that by 15. So just eight teaspoons into the tank and that's going to maintain our KH. It is good to dissolve this in water before you add it. But what I do is because I'm adding the water directly in with a hose, I normally just dose it on top of where the hose is and then I just let it dissolve as the tap water actually comes through. And I find that that works really well it tends to maintain my pH to no lower than an 8 and it's pretty good at buffering it to help it to stick around an 8.2 even doing a pretty large water change. So that works well. Then the other thing that you might want to consider doing too is if you want to raise your general hardness you can use some cichlid lake salt. The directions are a little bit more complicated but I'll explain them. So you are wanting to add a three quarter of a teaspoon per 40 litres. So for my tank, like I said before, I've got a total volume of water of 670 litres. So if I wanted to dose this whole tank and I hadn't dosed it before, what I would want to do is work out that 40 goes into 670 about 16 times. And then we know that we want three quarters of a teaspoon. So all you need to do is do 0.75 times 16 and then that's going to give you your value which is around about 12 teaspoons. So I'm just going to, I would just dose this with 12 teaspoons to raise my GH by 4.4 units. So because my tap water is already at an 8, I would only need to do that and that would be perfect. That would land me at a 12. Whereas if I was using water that was only having a GH of two, then I would need to double my dose to 24 teaspoons instead of 12 to dose this whole tank. So hopefully that makes sense. The dosages are kind of confusing. It took me a while to work it out, but it's just, this is raising it by 4.4 units. So you need to measure the general hardness of the water that you're putting in first to work out how much of this you actually do need to add in. And by adding that, I can get my GH up from the eight 
well actually technically from the nine since it naturally gets to a nine on its own. So I can get it from a nine to a 12 by adding this in. And the same applies where if you just do a 50% water change and you wanna add this back in, then you just half the dose. So you're never dosing the full tank if you're not taking out the full volume of water. You're just working out the percentage of water that you took out and then applying that to this for when you redose it. And if you just write down all of your dosages and you know exactly how much of a water change that you're doing, then it's pretty easy. You just have your teaspoon ready and you know exactly how much you need to put in each time that you do a water change to maintain your KH and your GH. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and remember that it's actually not that difficult to maintain a high pH and an adequate KH and GH for your African cichlids and it can be really beneficial because it's kind of fun to learn about and to play around with but it also means that your fish are going to be able to live up to their fullest potential as well and be really nice and bright and colourful which is pretty cool to see. If you liked this video please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and I would love for you to subscribe to my channel if you would like to see more videos like this in the future and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!